All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Leila Logesico. I'm the chair of the Landmarks Committee for Community Board 5. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. We have uh, three items on the agenda. Uh, we are going to start with um, an application by 130 West 42nd Street, followed by 130 Fifth Avenue, and then we will conclude the meeting with uh, 201 Park Avenue South. Um, a few words about how the meeting is going to proceed. Um, the applicants will have an opportunity to give a, a full uninterrupted yet concise uh, presentation. Um, and we really uh, ask applicants to be as concise as possible because although we only have three items, they're pretty robust. So we wanna make sure that you know, we have um, ample time to discuss the matter. Uh, and uh, also we wanna be mindful of uh, the time of the committee members and other applicants. Once this uh, presentation by the applicant concludes, members of the committee will have an opportunity to ask questions. Once this question period concludes, I will open up the floor to members of the public for questions and comments to the uh, application. Uh, the applicant will have an opportunity to respond. Once this period concludes, we will move to business session. During business session, only members of the committee are allowed to discuss the matter. We will make comments and then we will come to a resolution. We will make a motion. We will take a vote on this motion. This motion will be forwarded to the full board of Community Board 5 to be ratified and the vote of the full board it becomes the official position of Community Board 5. The full board meeting is on uh, Thursday, September the 12th. Luke, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and you can find the uh, Zoom link on uh, our website, uh, cb5.org. Um, so with uh, all of that said, um, we will start the uh, meeting with a presentation by um, the applicants for 130 West 42nd Street, also known as the Bush Towers. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present our work tonight. My name is Michael Granville. I'm an architect with Darius Tarby Architects. Uh, with me tonight is Farida Smila from my office, Valerie Campbell, our Landmarks Consultant, and Mr. Vivek Desai on ownership, representing ownership. Uh, we're here tonight to discuss replacing the uppermost tower roof at the Bush Tower. Um, the Bush Tower is a 1916 to 1918 construction vintage high-rise building on 42nd Street, south side of the block, between uh, Broadway and 6th Avenue. These historic <laughs> images of the building show you uh, how it looked, you know, more or less in the, at the time when it was constructed. In the years that have passed, Cityscape has changed oh. a bit and it now has tall oh towers next to it. Um, are you able to hear me? Sorry, I'm, is this all so far so good? Yeah. Uh, we, 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 can, we can hear you fairly well, Luke. Uh, do you have uh, any concerns? Yeah, if, uh, if you're not speaking, be sure to mute, uh, but we should be good, Michael. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I heard some murmuring in the background. I was just to make sure my tech was working right. Um, these are photos of the building as it is uh, visible currently from a few vantage points. Uh, over the past several years, uh, beginning in 2012, a great deal of historic restoration and preservation work's been done on the building, including restoration of the 42nd Street storefront, replacing a more modern replacement that had been there for many years. Uh, at the higher floors of the building, there's been a great deal of masonry and structural steel repair and restoration of various uh, decorative elements all around the building, um, including replacement of a pair of rather ornate copper urns at the 42nd Street side of the building. Uh, the work that we're talking about tonight is one of the last things proposed to be done, and uh, it is the replacement of the roof at the very top of the building. Is my cursor visible to people? Uh, this is a view of the building looking west on 42nd Street. Um, and it is 
the, the point of view from the public sidewalk where the roof is most visible. Uh, and as you can see, the roof is really not very visible at all, even from this vantage point. Here's another view of the building looking west from Times Square along 42nd Street. And you can see the building is now part of a fabric of high rises and you know, more obscured obviously than it used to be uh, by their presence. Our roof at 130 West 42nd Street is a hip roof structure that is or was originally roofed in batten seam copper. And the reason that we're meeting tonight and presenting to you tonight is we're proposing to replace this roof. Um, and as you can see now, it is, is no longer uh, visibly batten seam copper, but underneath this is that copper and what you're seeing is a later installed modified bitumen roof and layers of roofing mastic that were all applied over the copper uh, as a way of repairing leaks over the years. Uh, this coated roof, this modified bitumen recovery roof is itself falling apart from old age and sun exposure. Uh, the roof is really badly in need of replacement. Um, and also, if you'll take a look at the slide at the lower right hand corner, you'll see this cruciform steel object uh, sticking, up, sticking up from the ridge end of the roof. This is a steel armature that used to support a decorative floor de lis uh, that was installed, one at the north end and one at the south end of the roof. The middle slide in the top row is the south side and you see the armature is not there nor is the floor de lis um, the floor de lis were were lost decades ago but the steel armatures have remained and they have uh, been open, subject to weathering and rusting and are themselves not in good shape on this next slide uh, on the right side where my cursor is is a piece of the floor de lis armature from the south side that had become so rusted that it loosened and, and fell. Um, so those are, as part of this work, we are proposing to remove those remnants of the structure that once supported the floor de lis. These are some detailed photos of the roof assembly. We have made probes to show the various layers of the concrete uh, roof structure that is underneath the copper roofing, the copper roofing itself, the various slip sheets, and the uh, later modified bitumen layers. The slide on the right shows the deterioration of the bitumen layers, especially where it covering the battens where things are just splitting and opening up. We are proposing to remove all of the existing roofing down to the layer, the level of the, of the concrete uh, structural roof deck, which is a lightweight deck supported by a steel substructure. And we are proposing to replace the roofing membrane, not with copper, but rather with a membrane roof uh, using a polymethyl methacrylate resin, the, the trade name for it is Ciplast Parapro that comes in a patina green color. These various slides show the layerings that build up this roof and some mock-ups we did showing reproduction of the batten profile uh, that we would be creating using this, this roofing material. Uh, our decision making with respect to what type of roofing to put back was governed by a few things. Um, one is at 400 feet above the sidewalk and being minimally visible. Uh, we felt we had more uh, latitude to choose uh, different roofing systems. Uh, one of the concerns that guided our choice was uh, wind uplift and, and the, the extreme weather conditions that we're seeing more and more of in New York City. Um, and our concerns about reinstalling a copper roof that is attached to a 100 year old lightweight concrete uh, substructure uh, at only discrete points. Uh, a reinforced liquid membrane application like we're proposing is fully adhered 
uh, over the entire surface of the concrete substructure of the roof and is tested by the manufacturer and uh, we can have great assurances that it is highly resistant to wind uplift and negative forces, which we feel is very important here. Um, additionally, uh, during the construction phase, uh, handling uh, the liquid membrane and its reinforcement layers, which are lightweight fleeces and, and the like, is much safer to, to do in the confined and, and steep uh, areas above 42nd Street as well, uh, versus handling large sheets of formed copper. Uh, a, a benefit of using the liquid membrane product also is it does come in a very good patina green version that is, you know, quite nicely matches uh, aged, aged copper. And we would have that uh, green look right away as opposed to waiting for it uh, for decades to develop from new copper. Um, this system of roofing has been installed on other historic buildings in New York City, including the lower roof of the New York Stock Exchange. And while not a landmark, a significant building at 250 West 52nd Street. Uh, this slide is a view of the roof as it is today with the black modified bitumen and with the patina green surface that we would end up with uh, with our proposed re-roofing. Of course, this view was taken from uh, the window of an adjacent building. I think it must have been one Bryant Park or the Condé Nast building. Uh, it's not a view that one would ever see in reality because the, again, the building is, and this roof, rather the roof of this building is, is really minimally visible from any public vantage point. Uh, this is one of our drawings. It's showing the existing conditions at the roof and you can see the hip roof configuration and the disposition of the battens as they wrap around the ends of the building. All of these copper details and uh, depths and shapes would all be reproduced by uh, by us with the new roofing system we're proposing. Um, that was an existing conditions slide. This is a proposed condition slide essentially showing that it would be just exactly the same in terms of the batten patterns and so on. These drawings are elevations of the roof um, and I would just dwell on them for a moment. You can see at the ridge ends of the, of the of the roof, the plinths on which the fleur-de-lis once, once sat and where the armatures came up through the top of. Uh, those plinths would remain uh, in our re-roofing design and we would simply run the, the liquid membrane roofing up and over them, covering them. Um, now, one other advantage of the liquid membrane roofing is should the armatures for the Florida Lee and the Florida Lee themselves ever be reinstalled, this type of roofing membrane is very readily uh, altered. So the, the top surface of these plinths could be exposed, um, which would expose the old mounting surface for the steel armatures that are damaged and being removed now the new steel armatures could be attached to the structural steel ridge beam of the roof. And then the liquid membrane roofing uh, patched in and run onto the steel armature to make a good watertight seal at the roof. This type of roofing membrane is, is very adept at, at uh, conforming to and, and, and adhering to shapes like structural steel shapes. So it would work quite well uh, in the future should that work need to be done. These are some uh, details of, of the roof that we would be putting back in. In the left-hand image on this slide, you can see the built-in gutter that runs around the entire perimeter of this roof. And you can see how the batten seam profile would end a bit up, up, uh, up slope from that 
built-in gutter in the traditional fashion, although all of this, of course, is not within anyone's eyesight. Um, the built-in gutter itself would also be lined with this material, terminated on top of the terracotta copings that surround it. None of this, of course, visible. Um, so that is really the end of our slides and the description of the work we're proposing to do. Uh, would welcome any questions that anyone would have that I can hope to answer for you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we will do just that. We will open up to uh, questions by members of the committee. Uh, I will ask you to uh, use the uh, raise hand uh, button. Uh, which Please I let me know if you'd like to see any slides again. Of course. Uh, let's see if we have um, any questions. Uh, Tony uh, has a question. Tony, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Layla. Uh, just a quick question about the floor de lis. Um, you know, you're doing such a great job doing all these different components of the restoration. Did you give any thought of actually reinstating these? Uh, I know that they can be done in the future. But at this time, you guys didn't think it was worth it to do it now? Uh, no. Um, no, we felt that at this point in time, ownership was, was not seeking to put those back. Uh, and uh, we, were, we were just looking for a way to complete the roofing work in such a way that should they you know, want to revisit that in the future, they'd be able to. Thank you. Uh, Buzz has a question. Buzz, go ahead. Is he muted, maybe? Buzz. Buzz, uh, okay, sorry. Yeah. I'm in the wrong place. Ahead, uh, my question is, what is the estimated lifetime of this material? And how does it compare with previous roofs and with the old copper roof? Right. Um, well, these uh, polymethyl methacrylate roofs um, have, have warranties that are 25 to 30 years long. Um, their lifetime, though, is, is potentially longer than that. Um, and in comparison to copper, obviously we, you know, we have a, an aging copper roof on this building, but it, 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 it is still there and, uh, the building's a hundred years old. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure when the copper roof began to fail, but I think we all know as, as people who are involved in the preservation, uh, field that a, a copper roof is a very, very long lived roof and would last at least as long or longer than any membrane would though there are you know instances of of these of these liquid membrane roofs being 40 or 50 or 60 years old at this point in time the chemistry has been around for a while um, in this case though durability doesn't always isn't only limited to how does the material itself hold up uh, you know to the rigors of exposure to weather and so on we, we also want to assure ourselves that we have something that is going to have the best and surest chances of just staying on the building. Um, because as, as you know, we have uh, ex extreme weather seems to get more extreme every year. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had a tornado go down Prospect Park West in Park Slope where I live. Um, and we do have a 100 year old substrate that we're attaching to and the traditional methods of attaching a copper roof using nails into the substrate are, you know, ordinarily a, a, a sound and sturdy way of connecting um, a copper roof to a building. But at this height and subject to the weather that we're seeing, we feel it's prudent to have something that is even more uh, secure, securely attached to the building, such that should, should any portion of it begin to loosen, all of the square inches of material adjacent to it remain tight. So this was, this was part of our 
criteria for the, the recommendations we've made to ownership. All right, thank you. Uh, Karen Pedrazzi has a question. Karen, go ahead. Yeah, hi, this is a follow-up to Tony's question about the floor delay. Um, did the owner not elect to go ahead with that due to cost? And my second question is, um, did this come about because of a local law requirement? Well, look, uh, I would say yes, cost is a, was a factor. Um, and the uh, loosened uh, South Florida, which had actually fallen, of course, that's a facade safety and inspection program concern. Um, and the other armature also, while not loose as this, as the South one is at this moment, is also exposed for many years to the weather. So there is some concern about how it's holding up in, uh, the, in the years to come. If I could also add, it's Valerie Campbell, um, we don't have good documentation as to what that fleur de lis even look like or the size. And um, there is extraordinarily limited visibility of it in any event, so. Thank you. Just uh, to clarify, um, I'm not sure that I got the answer to Karen's question. Is this part of any local law um, requirement? Uh, no, the roofing work itself, um, that, that's a bit discussive. Uh, the, the, I, and I would say yes, the roofing work needs to be done for this building to be considered safe from a local law 11 or as it's now called facade inspection and safety program point of view. Okay, so currently you're... Um... Um, you're unsafe or safe with repairs? I think we're, I think we're swamp right now. Okay, you're swamp. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Members of the committee? Uh, yeah, Mike. Mike Kabat, go ahead. Mike? Be sure to unmute. Okay, sorry. Is the, green, is the green substance is that painted on? Is it a plastic? Is it a liquid? And what is being done to protect the, uh, the people downstairs? What kind of a substance is that green? Uh, the, it's a, it is a, a, a type of waterproofing membrane that is called a catalyzed resin. Proofing, so it is a two-part chemical that, when mixed together in a short period of time, hardens to a rubbery consistency. And the, the entire assembly of of the um, of the roofing product is a a base sheet of modified bitumen membrane that's about an eighth of an inch thick that gets adhered to the concrete substrate of the roof over which this liquid membrane gets applied. And the liquid membrane itself is kind of a three-stage application. When it's mixed up, it's about the consistency of a thin milkshake. And it is rolled into place with a paint roller, uh, kind of a long nap paint roller to a certain thickness. And then into it is pressed a kind of t-shirt thickness white fleece, which you can see in the left-hand photo here uh, where my cursor is moving. And then that fleece is in turn rolled again um, with the green milkshake thickness liquid. Um, and what the fleece does is two things. It reinforces the liquid and it also serves as a way of controlling the thickness of the application. So once the the second coat is applied and the fleece is no longer visible, the installer has the, uh, can know that the material has been applied to the proper thickness. Um, in terms of protecting the public, the entire uh, roof area will be scaffolded, there'll be sidewalk bridging. Um, and as, in terms of the occupancy of the building, uh, the, 
this area is well above any occupied part of the building. The, the material does have a smell. It dissipates very quickly and uh, will not be uh, noticeable by the, by the occupants because it's so up out of the way. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chuck Miller, Chuck, you have a question, go ahead. Uh, a very quick question. When we look at the, uh, at the copper now, has most of the copper been covered by the chemical that's already there, by the, by the membrane that's already there? Every inch of it. Okay, and do you know when that happened? Uh, no, long before our time. And from the looks of it, it it's got to be decades. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, members of the committee? Okay, so seeing none, I will move to open up the floor to members of the public. Members of the public, if you have questions or comments uh, to this application, please use the uh, raise, hands, uh, raise hand function and then Luke will uh, permit you to speak. Do we have any raised hands from uh, members of the public? And if you're calling in from a phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Any questions from members of the public? Okay, so seeing none, we will move uh, back uh, to business session. During business session, only members of the committee are allowed to discuss the matter. And uh, I await your comments. Uh, use the uh, raise hand uh, function so that we can have a uh, orderly uh, comment period. Who wants to start? Chuck, it was your application. Why don't you start? Um, I will. Um, I, I, I'm interested in, uh, in the opinion of those who have been on the committee longer than I. Uh, from my observation, it seems to me that given that it is minimally visible, given that the membrane has already uh, lost whatever copper feature it has, uh, I didn't see any objection. In terms of the floor de lis I can see that that would be helpful, um, but it's not there now. And so I was inclined to, uh, to uh, view the proposal favorably. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah, for a little bit of context, um, I would say that, you know, typically the committee uh, gives certainly more leeway to applicants for elements that are not visible. And uh, I think it's pretty clear for uh, this particular building that the roof is not visible. Um, I would also add for uh, members of the committee who have not been on this committee for so long that uh, this uh, particular building has been in front of, uh, of the committee numerous times. Um, and over the years, uh, the, uh, the ownership of the building has done a good job of uh, restoring the, uh, the, the building. I, you know, it's a very special building. Um, it is actually the very first skyscraper of New York City. Uh, very beautiful. It's, it's a little swallowed by uh, its uh, surrounding uh, taller neighbors now. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really a, a special building and the, the ownership has been taking, you know, good care of the building and has, uh, you know, always worked in a, in a collaborative fashion with, uh, with our, our board. So, you know, just for a little bit of context. I see that Karen has her hand up. Karen, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I concur with Charles's comments. And I think it was um, a very thoughtful techno technology a technical solution. I'm familiar with the roofing product they've used. It's tried and true and has a long, long life. Um, so I'm, I'm in favor of the application. Thank you, Karen. Any other uh, comments? Okay, seeing none, let me uh, phrase it this way. Does anyone has an objection with this application? Are there any objections to this application? Okay, seeing none, uh, I think everybody concurs with uh, Chuck and Karen's uh, comments. Uh, Chuck, do you wanna make a motion? Uh, I so move. To? To approve. Okay, <laughs> just to make sure. Uh, thank you. So this will be the first vote of uh, the evening. Um, Buzz. Yes. Uh, Renee Kefaro. Yes. Uh, James. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Laura. Yes. John. Yes. Nick. 
I don't know that if Nick is with us. Um, Suzanne. Yes, thanks for the history too, Layla. Thank you. Uh, Richard? Yes. Mike? Yes. Renee Kinsella? Yes. Uh, Sam? Yes. Chuck? Yes. Uh, Janet? Yes. Karen? Yes. And me, I am a yes, and the motion passes. It's a unanimous vote. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are now- Layla, you forget, forgot Tony. Oh, Tony says yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, and Tony, thank you. Uh, sorry about that, Tony. Um, okay, so we are moving on to the next, um, the next application, which is uh, 135th Avenue. And um, this is an application for uh, storefront operations. I believe that we have the applicant with us and uh, please feel free to uh, load up your presentation and share your screen. And um, um, let's see what happened. I'm sorry, I lost everybody. Okay, here we are. Sorry about that. I had a little glitch on my end. Um, okay, so um, we have the applicant with us and uh, please go ahead and uh, you can give us your presentation. Okay. Hi, uh, good evening. I'm Erin Ruley from Higgins Quays Barth and Partners. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time tonight to uh, review our application. Um, I'm joined by Richard Woodward of GKV Architects, and they are design architects for the project. Um, I'll walk you through some of the existing conditions and the history, and, and Richard will walk you through the design. Um, we also have David Berman from CVS and uh, Mark Lundy from the uh, Retail Space Ownership um, for any questions that you might have. Uh, the project is located at 135th Avenue in the Ladies Mile Historic District. That's at the northwest corner of um, uh, 18th Street and 5th Avenue. And this is for the, the retail space at the ground floor. It's going to be a, a new CVS location. And it was formerly or most recently occupied by, by the, the Express. Uh, proposals for new storefront uh, signage and to create a new entry in the easternmost bay on 18th Street. So yeah, thanks, Richard. Um, and uh, the new storefronts will replace existing 1990s storefronts. Um, and we'll take a look at uh, the details more closely, but they're a combination of historic and non-historic elements. Um, and the new storefront infill will, will more closely recall the historic configuration. Um, the new entry will include automatic doors to allow for unobstructed access. And that's in that easternmost bay on 18th Street. Um, and as we all know today, pharmacies are providing more um, critical healthcare services in addition to the pharmacy needs um, and access for disabled and other escorted customers who um, need assistance through the doors is critical. Um, Richard will walk you through some of the practical constraints, um, but today more than ever, contact-free access is, is very much needed. Um, and so this proposal is really a well-designed entry that relates to the new storefront system. Um, it's rooted in the consistent commercial change in this historic district, uh, which has a long history of commercial reuse from the earliest altered buildings that were used. They were residential buildings altered for um, uh, commercial use and then the commercial and retail changes as the industry and tenancies changed within the building. Um, next slide. Uh, 135th Avenue is an 11 story store and loft building constructed in 1902 and 1903, um, designed by uh, Robert Meineke, who was prolific in the historic district, as you likely know. Um, and so on the left, we can see the, the overall view. The 18th Street um, elevation is on the left and 5th Avenue on the right. And then the two photos on the right show the, the base uh, details of the base condition. So the top photo is 5th Avenue. The entry on the right is the main building entry. The entry on the left is the existing Fifth Avenue building entry. 
um, and then they sort of sandwich a, a storefront um, on fit, one single storefront on Fifth Avenue. Um, on 18th Street, uh, there's a consistent storefront configuration um, in four bays, and the bay to the, all the way to the right that says Express is the subject bay where the, the new entry would be created. Um, next slide. And then we'll just take a walk around the building. This at the top left, we're at the, the westernmost bay. Uh, it's a freight entry. Um, there's going to be some work there. That's all going to be approved at staff level. It meets the staff level rules. Um, and then we uh, see the first uh, bay in uh, the, the, of the storefront. Um, on the bottom is all of 18th Street. The bay with labeled express is the bay with the new entry. And so here you can start to see um, some of the existing conditions. The, the storefront bulkhead and the cornice for each of the storefront bays is historic, uh, dates to a 1920s alteration. Um, and then the display window framing and infill is all contemporary. Um, and uh, what you see there are three equal panes um, in the storefront. So it's an equal division. Um, and that does not um, match what was there historically. It would have had a, a wide central uh, display window flanked by two narrow windows. Um, and we'll see those in the uh, historic photograph. Um, and it, there's also a, a metal transom and that's where the, the signage is affixed now and that's opaque. Um, and so that all dates to the 90s and then sort of that is sandwiched between the, the historic fabric at the storefront cornice and, and bulkhead. Next slide. And then just a few more details of this is a typical window bay on the top left. We see the historic bulkhead with the um, contemporary infill and the cornice, historic cornice above. Um, there's a bay with louvers, which um, there'll also be louvers in the new proposal, but those also meet the, the staff level rules. And then just a couple of details at the bottom of the uh, storefront cornice and bulkhead. Next slide. And then uh, just a quick look at some of the historic conditions on the left. This photo is dated 1915. It's actually uh, around 1905, I think. Um, but this is the original condition. And um, so what you see there are um, projecting storefronts, which were original to the building. Um, and there is a, um, uh, an entry included a little farther down, a couple of entries actually on, on uh, 18th Street. Um, and those existed um, from the time of construction until the early 1920s. Um, also of note is the, the signage, which when you're in full view, rises up the full height of, the, of that corner pier. Um, and um, the uh, signage along the, the base of the building. Um, next slide. Oh, oh, no, not next slide. We'll stay here. Um, go back to 1927. Yeah, exactly. So in 1924, the, the tenancy of the, the, um, the retail space changes to a bank. Um, and so we see a couple of shifts. One is that the storefronts are replaced with new flush storefronts. And this is this happens along Fifth Avenue as, um, you know, in the teens and 20s, they, um, they reduced all of the encroachments on Fifth Avenue. So all of those really spectacular projecting bays, many of those go away. Um, ours goes away in, in the early 20s with the um, uh, introduction of the bank at the, at the retail space. Um, and so here you can see um, that, that configuration that I was describing, the, the large central bay flanked by two narrower bays um, in, the, in the Fifth Avenue storefront. And then um, and then shifts in signage um, on the corner pier and at the at the sign band um, at the second floor cornice and um, a spectacular array of flagpoles um, at that point. Um, but then um, then maybe go to the tax photo, Richard. Oh, great, thank you. Um, and then 1940s tax photo shows uh, consistent uh, storefront configuration, new signage, um, and all of this is, uh, you know, very typical in the historic district. The storefronts, the infill, and uh, signage all change and evolve as the commercial use um, and the buildings are reused um, by various tenancies. Um, so now I think I'll pass the presentation over to Richard, who can walk you through the design details. Good evening. Good. Um, so this, uh, as uh, Aaron said, we're on the north northwest corner of Fifth Avenue and 18th Street. Uh, this is the um, the two 
plan elevations that we're looking at. We're going to start with 18th Street with the elevations and then move on to Fifth Avenue. So these are um, the existing elevations in the top of 18th Street and the proposed at the bottom. Uh, the um, obviously we're, we're, we're retaining the historical detail uh, at the bulkhead and the cornice above and below the, the new um, storefront. The storefront is, um, is being um, updated to a double glazed um, system for compliance with New York City Energy Code. And uh, the biggest um, change is that uh, the current storefront is equally divided in th typically in three bays uh, in the largest um, um, modules. And um, the new proposed storefront is reflecting these historical modules um, that Aaron alluded to in the photographs, uh, which don't provide equal lights. They have a larger light in the center and smaller ones on the outside. Uh, starting at the left-hand side, um, the freight doors are being uh, removed and replaced. Currently, they have a post in the center, so that will be removed. And uh, we're applying uh, new insulated uh, hollow metal doors with uh, embossed panels in this bay. Um, the remaining uh, storefront is being uh, removed um, and replaced with the new double glazed units. Um, and this is the bay on the end where uh, the new sliding door assembly is being inserted. There'll be some more detail on that on future slides. Uh, I'll just overview the signage a little bit. Uh, there is a display wall two feet back from the glass, which is represented by this uh, pale peach color. Um, there is also uh, illuminated signage the, CV, the red CVS uh, pharmacy um, and uh, this um, minute clinic light box um, and also the heart here are all illuminated. They're all 18 inches behind the glass uh, on the interior of the building. The exterior signs on this facade are um, applied signs here for CVS pharmacy. So I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, on the outside, which is a non-illuminated sign, a receiving entrance um, sign here on the freight doors. And then um, these uh, decals at uh, the new entrance, which, which uh, provide the operating hours and another static sign above this new entry. Going to Fifth Avenue. Um, again, the equally spaced module is being uh, redivided um, to um, reflect the existing details in the bulkhead. So there's a much larger bay in the center. Uh, signage wise, again, these red signs, the CVS pharmacy, the minute clinic, and this red heart are all illuminated, but they're all 18 inches back from the glass. Uh, again, we have open hours, which is applied vinyl on the, on the new door and um, a static sign on the exterior of the building um, above this large storefront window. Um, as we've been saying, the, the existing module was equally spaced um, along the uh, each bay. Um, the widest bay is about 23 feet wide. Uh, in reference to the bulkhead below, we've extended the size of the interior um, section of the bay to a much larger piece of glass. Um, and moving with the double glazed um, units, there are some limitations in terms of availability, which is forcing um, butt joints in the glazing um, to subdivide the center section. Um, in section, uh, again, the, um, the historical detail at the bulkhead and the cornice are being retained. 
um, express previously had show windows with mannequins inside to display uh, clothing. Uh, so that wall is going to be removed and there'll be a small display when, display wall uh, which um, reflects the area shown um, in, in peach um, on the elevations, which will have some signage, but will be two feet back from deglazing. Um, and likewise on Fifth Avenue, a very similar scenario. Uh, this is the existing doorway. The geometry is staying the same. Uh, the doors and windows are being replaced, upgraded. Uh, we've been through this signage, so I won't uh, go back to that, but um, it's... Uh, oh, the, the, the other thing to mention is that uh, we have uh, clear glazing at uh, the, um, the bulkhead where previously there was uh, the metal panels and signage band. So um, around the perimeter, um, we are showing, so I'm going to go back a couple of sheets. So here we have uh, clear glazing with an opaque gray film applied in the interior to screen the, um, uh, the roll down security grill and the ceiling space. Um, whereas this previously was a solid metal panel. This is the freight door where the center division and the existing geometry is being removed and uh, a new uh, free opening is being provided with the embossed doors um, and adjacent again the historical bulkhead is remaining. Uh, some sections at the freight. This is the, the bay where the um, sliding doors are being inserted to provide uh, better access into the store. Um, the center bay is affected by having to have this uh, additional transom. It's a three part door with the left one being fixed and the two on the right retracting in will be an ADA entrance, uh, which would supplement access from the fifth, from fifth Avenue. Uh, there's these um, decals on the side, which um, meet the requirements uh, in terms of area. Uh, this is a detail of the static signs, which are on the exterior of the building. They're non-illuminated. Uh, there's one smaller one in the bay above the sliding doors and two slightly larger ones um, on the other two sections of facade. And this is the illuminated sign, uh, which is 18 inches uh, inside the glazing, uh, one on each facade. Uh, and this is a proposed um, elevation showing a combination of all these elements. Um, again, the, in terms of signage, just these white signs here are on the facade as well as the decals um, at the doorways. Uh, you can get a representation of how the uh, sliding doors may appear on the side. And then these light pink um, zones are set back from the glass on those short uh, display walls. I think I'm going to pause there. All right, thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of uh, clarifying questions. I'm not sure I understand uh, the pink uh, treatment at the bottom of. Yes. Uh, so may maybe we can stay on stay on this slide. Can you actually just blow it bigger so maybe we can? Sure. Have yeah, I'm not sure how, how much that will help, but this this is a low wall, which is uh, within the. Um, uh, it, it's uh, 24 inches behind the glazing. So there's a, there's a shelf in between the two, the display window. Okay, so this is not a uh, an application on the glazing. This it is, is not. This is a 3D element that is behind. Correct. 
Okay. Correct. Okay. And it's actually, it's red, but because it's on the interior, we sort of lightened it so that it indicated that it was on the interior, but it's the tip, it's a uh, fairly typical CVS red patterned um, display wall setback within the storefront installation. But it, just so that I understand correctly, it sits flush against the glazing and it's- No, two no, feet back. I, I, let me, get, let me go back. back. Yeah. It's sitting on this face here. So two feet back from, from uh, the storefront. And can, can you explain what is this uh, horizontal line that goes from this wall to uh, the glazing? This line? No, the one underneath. This one, yeah. Uh, this is just a um, framing for a display window. And but what, what does it mean? Because this will be visible from, from the street. Um, it's like a, it's the window sill essentially on yes. the interior. And what is it so made of? Uh, hi, this is Dave sure. from CVS. I just wanted to Thanks, clarify. Dave. I have my uh, signage person on also, but uh, I don't believe anything would be put in that area. It's just for the window graphics themselves. So it's going to be what ply, ply, painted plywood. It is a material uh, that's like vinyl that's attached to the uh, drywall or wood. Okay, thank you. Um, I will open up the floor to questions from members of the committee. Members of the committee, do you have questions? Please use your uh, raise hand uh, button. Any questions? Uh, Mike Kback, go ahead. Okay. Um, the original three-part bay was that convex out? Or was it flat like the new? The original was convex; it projected. But in the 1920s, that was removed and replaced with a flush storefront, which um, maybe you could go back to the 1927 photo, um, Richard. And, um, and that's the, the fragments that exist, the bulkhead and the, the uh, existing cornice date to that 1920s storefront. So that's flush what we're looking at now. Okay, Th thank you. Um, other questions, members of the committee? Uh, Tony, go ahead. Tony Testa. Thanks, Leila. Uh, for the Fifth Avenue entry door, um, I'm just, I was trying to zoom in to see all the fine print. I see that you're mentioning that the new door will be double glazed. Is it going to be an aluminum frame door? Yes. Okay, and, and aluminum also for the, uh, the sliding door on the side. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you. And the storefronts as well, the new storefronts. Uh, Layla, I can't find the, it's Renee, I can't find the raised hand thing for some reason on my phone. Me neither. It's gone. I, I, I don't know where it went, and I apologize. I'm not on my laptop, so maybe that's my problem. Um, but I have a Go question. Ahead. Is if they would consider another kind of door that might be more contextual than a sliding door, like, um, you know, just having regular doors, or um, I don't know, I think there might be in the lady's mile even like a revolving door or two, um, but you know, an electric sort of sliding door, I understand is is customary for a CVS um, and all that good stuff, but I'm a little concerned about the modernity of that in that neighborhood, because I can't at the top of my head think of another place in Ladies Mile where we've allowed that. But yeah, if someone- um, knows, Hi, this is Dave Berman from CVS. Um, we're, we're also concerned about our, our customer's safety and ease of entering and exit, exiting the store especially during those you know, hours when uh, things at least typically used to get busier. Um, we did receive approval from Landmarks on a couple of uh, projects that we did, uh, namely uh, the Brill uh, at Broadway and 49, 1619 Broadway. Uh, we matched uh, the facade and we have the, uh, the sliding doors there. 
uh, also to the left on uh, 6th Avenue and Washington Street, uh, where we did receive landmarks approval also uh, in that location. But I mean, the main concern is our customers ease of flowing in and out of the store. Uh, things got a little crowded uh, with the previous tenant just having that one door there when people are entering and exiting. Uh, it can become an unsafe uh, situation. Uh, thank you. I would I would say that uh, the uh, the CVS that used to be on uh, Broadway uh, between 18 and 19th Street in the Ledesma Historic District did not have um, uh, automatic doors. Um, they had uh, manual doors that were contextual to uh, to the building. Um, oh, it looks like the raise hand function has come back, and Karen has her hand up. Karen, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm. I echo Renee's concern about the sliding doors. They, I understand the the ease of use and the accessibility. I appreciate, but they appear very, very flat and flush. And what I guess I'm really missing of over the years, what's gone by, is losing that depth. And that the the sliding doors appear just very, very flat to me. Um, and I just wondered. We're, we're still in, in questions, so. Yeah, sorry. My question is, how do they operate? Is there a button or is there a camera? How do the um, automatic sliding doors open? And because they are so prominent and flush to the street, might a passerby activate them? You know, are they more automated, like you see in a grocery store or a hospital? I'm just wondering how the ADA accessibility works on those. And then, um, should I ask all my questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, my second question is about the security grill. I see it in the detail and I'm just wondering if that's just uh, like you inherited that and you're just leaving it there or do you plan on deploying that security grill? Will we see it behind the storefront? And if so, like what, what, what times a day? My third question also about timing is, is this a 24 hour, seven days a week um, operating a drugstore? And if so, like will the fluorescent lights be on all night? Because sometimes mm -hmm. I've seen landmark buildings be energy exempt. And I think with the new energy code, you're no longer allowed to have a landmark exempt. And I'm just wondering what you're gonna see as you drive up and down the avenue into the window at night, will it be like flooded with fluorescent light, which is just, um, even though we don't you know, weigh in on the interior, it impacts the brightness of the whole overall architectural landmark. Yes, this is Herman again from CBS. So, uh, to answer your questions, uh, first question, 24 hours, all our stores uh, are 24 hours in Manhattan, um, and they have been. Um, so, and what was the other question? I'm sorry. Well, like um, oh, how, the, how the doors operate. The right, ADA the sensitivity. Yes, the sensitivity to the doors are the same throughout the city, and obviously uh, they only open when people are entering the store. Uh, I believe there's a camera but they do not open and close uh, when people are walking up and down the street. Otherwise we'd have serious uh, energy uh, problems and, and costs in the store. So we're well aware of that. And uh, that has not been an issue in the city. So, so is there an accessibility button you push if you're a person in a wheelchair? Uh, they open up automatically, these doors. Be a motion sensor, but I yeah. think the motion sensor will be trained. Thank you to only pick up uh, movement close to the doors. And I think I, I just if I could add something, I, yeah, I've had a sort of a crash course on these automatic doors because um, they're you know they're they're somewhat new to me. Um, but my understanding, and Richard, perhaps you can amplify this, is um, that the idea is that when people are escorted, um, clients, customers that come in, if someone needs assistance, you can't. Um, physically hit an actuator, have out swinging doors, and then be able to like smoothly enter the space with um, someone who's accompanied. Um, or if a person is in a wheelchair, you have a sort of busy corner and you have double out swinging doors that require a contact on the actuator, then um, it's, it, it, there are, you know, one given COVID-19 and how we're dealing with um, contact in general, um, but also just the security and ease of access uh, for people in mm -hmm. that need need assistance. Um, and I think the in terms of the overall design, the idea here was to maintain um, the historic bulkheads 
establish the side lights, um, all of that would be trimmed and detailed consistent with uh, the historic, the restored storefronts. Um, and then within that center bay, have the opportunity for the, um, for the, uh, uh, the sliding doors. So it would be all within something that is very consistent with the other restored storefronts. Uh, Karen also had a question on the um, the rolling grill. The security grill is existing, but I don't, I don't know if you're going to use it, David. Uh, yeah, we typically don't use them. Because it's open 24 hours. Correct. Okay. Um, and then I think in the storefront, the where the, they they currently exist, the security grills exist behind the metal panels that replaced the where the transoms would have been. And so with the new storefront system, there's an entirely new uh, glazed transom. And instead of having an opaque panel there, we just will use back paint or film to obscure the area behind so that whoever uses the storefront next has the ability to open that back up again if they want as a storefront transom. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions by members of uh, the committee? Karen has a follow-up question, I believe. Follow Karen. Yeah, just going back to the sliding doors, is there a second uh, set of doors that create a vestibule? In the plan, we're only seeing one, but is there a second line of doors? There is, yes, as part of the interior fit up. Okay. Yeah, that's always the case in a lot of CVSs. Right. Richard, do you want to pull up the plan? It's like a diagonal. They run on the diagonal, right, from pier to pier on the interior. Uh, I actually don't that have out. that plan in this set. Right. Are, are you able to uh, to pull the the plan, or you don't have it? Um, I can I can source it, but we should continue and come back to it. Okay, okay. Um, uh, Karen, do you have any other follow up questions? That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions by members of the committee? Okay, um, I, I have a couple. Can you actually explain the rationale for uh, alterations to the freight uh, entrance? Uh, the, the, there, there isn't really any uh, geometrical changes there. The, 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 main is, the main reason is to um, open up the double doors instead of having two single doors. There'll be one clear opening without a post in the center. Can you put the existing condition photo up, Richard? Can you, can you sure. bring the, um, the elevation for the, uh, for the freight um, entrance? Yes. Um, we don't have elevation of, I think. Plenty of yeah, like this, yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, awesome, thank you. So it, it looks like you are uh, removing quite a bit of um, historic fabric around this, uh, um, uh, this mean of egress. Um, and replacing it with um, a more uh, more modern uh, materials, is this no longer going to be uh, a freight entrance? It is both a freight entrance and an egress path of, path of egress. There's there's no historic fabric being removed. The the existing doors are flush. The only the doors are being removed, and the post that's you can't you can't see the post. It's behind the doors. Um, currently, and they are, those are flush metal doors, not historic, and they're being replaced at staff level, um, but with new metal doors that have landmarks requires that you do a, a panelized treatment so that it more closely recalls the historic condition, and that's what um, being, they're being replaced with. Oh, okay. Okay, it, it, thank you. Thank you for the, the clarification. Um, and uh, can you also explain to us the rationale, like the functionality rationale for uh, creating a new opening on 18th Street? Because you still have the opening on uh, Fifth Avenue, correct? 
Yes, this is uh, Dave again from CVS. So just that was a CVS question. Um, we are a convenience business, and uh, again, we tend to get busy. You know, certain hours. Obviously, people are coming and going to work and lunchtime. And when things are getting busy, we like to create the most convenient access to the store uh, as possible. So most all our stores have uh, double doors. Every prototype does, and obviously. Uh, this is a landmark building, um, but uh, we did want to uh, maintain those uh, safer uh, conditions for ingress and egress here uh, as well. And most all of our stores in the city uh, do have this type of entrance, uh, okay. the entrance on both thank streets. You. Um, thank you. Um, any other uh, questions by members of the committee? Okay, seeing none, um, I will open up the floor to uh, members of the public. Uh, members of the public, if you have any questions, please use the uh, raise hand function. Um, and Luke will uh, allow you to speak. Um, Luke, if you want to let those uh, who are calling in how to do the um, raise hand uh, with their phone, that would be great. Star nine, um, I don't see anybody. Okay. Uh, any questions from uh, members of the public on this application? Okay, so seeing none, uh, we will move back to a uh, business session for uh, comments by members of, uh, of the committee. Um, I will start with uh, making two comments. Uh, the first one is that uh, automatic doors uh, on Fifth Avenue in a uh, the uh, historic district, uh, especially the Ladies Mile, um, in a building that is so prominent is uh, very problematic. Um, I don't believe that there are any automatic doors of that type on Fifth Avenue. Um, and uh, as we know, precedents uh, do matter and uh, we certainly don't want to uh, you know, take this uh, slippery slope uh, because it would become extremely slippery. Um, the second comment I would make is that although um, the illuminated signage is 18 inches uh, behind the, um, the glazing and therefore um, with compliance with the general rules of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, uh, we all know because we have experienced it that the CVS uh, brightness is actually uh, of a pretty, you know, pretty strong and um, that, you know, the, the amount of signage is pretty generous um, and uh, it will be a bright red uh, little uh, spot that uh, will certainly have an impact on the, the general district. Uh, so those are my two comments, but um, I would like to hear more from uh, members of the committee. And I see a hand raised. Um, I will start with uh, Renee, Renee uh, Kefaro, go ahead. Hi, I'm now on my laptop, so I have the raise hand function. Um, yeah, no, I just really wanted to just quickly just underscore what you just said, Layla. I'm really having trouble. I understand the ease of that and, you know, the touch free and all the rest of it about sliding doors. But, um, you know, we do have to sort of gauge and temper uh, modern needs with the landmark the same way that we do with, um, you know, uh, ADA ramps and things of that nature. And so it's a delicate balance. And I'm slightly nervous that folks that may not have any real reason for it um, would start doing uh, different kinds of doors that are non-contextual if, if we let this precedent be set. So then I'm just very uncomfortable with that. And I'm interested to hear what everyone else has to say on this before I can vote. Thank you, Renee. Um, Suzanne Johnson, Suzanne, go ahead. Um, I was going to, uh, I will now concur both with you, Layla and Renee um, it, with what our goal is, I think here, and I think this is a you know brilliantly done. But I think that um, given the contextual uh, responsibilities we have to this beautiful building and the precedence that has been set in the area, um, that the rationale for this being a convenience build business, um, as we know it is, is not enough to, um, in my opinion, 
um, make way for these type of doors um, and also this um, generous and or excessive amount of light and how it will impact contextually this part of town as well as this building specifically. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Dawson. Uh, yeah, I go to CVS all the time. I'm across the street from it. The doors slide open for me. Uh, I'll just put in a vote for let them have the sliding doors because if we don't let them have it, then maybe they can't be there at all. Um, but you guys know more. So, but that's we, my we comment. We actually typically don't uh, let youth come into uh, interference with uh, with the decisions. We're really the landmarks committee, so we look at. So then I'll withdraw the comment. <laughs> no, that's fine. But I, I just want to bring a little little context for for everyone. Um, thank you, Sarah. Uh, okay. Richard. Uh, yeah. In, initially, I was thinking that the. Uh, sliding doors were great because it would really permit access but as i've been hearing this conversation and uh looking at a couple of things one is that uh they're actually doubling the amount of uh the number of entrances which i think is a good thing you know but they're actually changing what what has been a window to a door entrance and I see that they have that vestibule, which gives quite a bit of ability for people to manage the, the, the transition from being in the store proper to exiting or entering. I, I, and I also was thinking initially about the accessibility issue for someone, but my understanding is the existing door is ADA accessible. Uh, and you know, so I, I sort of, I, you know, the, I'm now convinced that the uh, uh, the historic context is sufficient to warrant not supporting the double doors, given that I don't see a strong need for it in terms of accessibility in general or uh, 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 ADA accessibility. Thank you. Uh, Tony, Tony, go ahead with your comment. Uh, thank you. Uh, Layla, with what you said earlier, too, the first thing that jumped out at me was the amount of signage um, that CVS red is definitely bright red. And the fact that the lower walls behind the windows, the display wall will be very low, that very bright, concentrated fluorescent light will also be quite visible from the street, which again is interior. But CVS in general just gives off a very different feel uh, to the to the neighborhood. Um, but a lot of signage, a lot of it bright red. Um, some of it is redundant. It's the bright red light up stuff just inside 18 inches. And then it's on the sign, uh, the, the sign bands up above. I was, um, I was looking around. There is another CVS in our historic district here on 6th and 19th Street on the northeast corner. That one does not have sliding doors. It does have doors on each corner and then their diagonal entry in the middle. It does not have the... Um, the sliding doors there. So it is possible and it is possible with the CVS model, um, unless it's changed since I've walked by there in the last few months. Um, my, you know, originally my other concern was also just the addition of the door, removal of that bay. And though it's not original, it is certainly historic. Um, but I think, I think that's something I've kind of gotten over. I haven't heard a lot of concern about that. So that's not one of my major concerns, but just something that did pop up. Yeah, I, I would echo this this comment actually, Tony. I think that um, we we certainly are uh, you know uh, considering an application that is uh, you know turning a window into a door and therefore removing a, a large amount of uh, of historic fabric. Um, this this is something that I you know I think that the adaptive reuse of a space is something that we we have to keep in mind, and we want these spaces to remain functional. And uh, we know, you know, from the historic photographs that, you know, some of those bay windows were actually doors historically. So the sort of, you know, game of Bonto, I can uh, contemplate. I think that, um, you know, it, it's, it has to be for the right circumstances. 
um, but certainly the uh, opening mechanism uh, doubled with removal of historic fabric, I think would be really uh, detracting from uh, the, the context of this particular building and uh, the, the district. Uh, I certainly agree with that. Um, I see uh, that Richard uh, has further comments. Richard, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, regarding Tony, what, what Tony said, uh, you know, I, I didn't mention this first time, I'm also very troubled by the amount of bright lighting, but I, I, I thought a couple of things that Tony said, I don't know if I, I misunderstood, but the, the exterior signage is, uh, is white. Uh, and, and and not lit. So I, I thought you were saying that that was yet another red element. And then uh, the low, you know, the what is shown here as pink or whatever. That my understanding is that's that's not lit, right? It's only the the, the hanging signs that are lit. Did I did I misunderstand that? None of this is to say that I like what they're doing, but I, I just sort of wanted to actually make sure we were talking about the same conditions. Uh, cool. I will allow. I will allow the applicant to clarify. Is there any lighting at the um, at the base of uh, the um, the window, the windows, the show windows? There's none anticipated. I think, David. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm just waiting for my signage uh, person to join. Um, but um, the uh, signs themselves obviously are interior lit uh, red block letters, so they're not overly uh, bright. Um, and the question was? Is there going to be any lighting at uh, the, uh, the bottom of the, um, at the framing of the, uh, the bay window? Yeah, where the cursor yeah, is. There is some, uh, some soft lighting uh, projecting towards the uh, window graphics. So into the uh, store. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. So to, to uh, make sure that everybody is on board, so there will be basically uh, uh, lighting, uh, sort of like framing those, uh, th those windows. Uh, Karen has a further comment. Karen, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I concur with the committee's comments so far. W one of the items I wanted to add to that was that, you know, a, a prominent store, a well-known prominent store like CVS, of course, has brand appeal and signage and store standards, so they all look somewhat unified. But I think in the case of a landmark, these institutions should be able to modify or, you know, should defer to the landmark. And while I appreciate um, the brand elements, I think that they should you know, if this is a rollout, just like every other CVS in a non-historic landmark building, I think some give back should be taken for, you know, for selecting the site in this location. And I don't think that's a lot to ask for them to um, respect the landmark by maybe modifying somewhat of their, their standards, whether it's lighting or graphics or sliding doors. Um, well, you know, we've been through a lot of so, David, I'm, David, I'm sorry, we, we're in, in a business session at oh, this point. Only members of the, uh, of the committee um, are allowed to discuss the, the matter. Um, th thank you for your understanding. Um, thank you, Karen, for your comments. Um, do we have any further comments uh, from members of the committee? And if I hear uh, the, the, their comments, um, so far, um, we have problems with this particular application and uh, we seem to be more inclined to deny. Uh, Renee Kinsella has her hand up. Renee, go ahead. Hi, Leila. Nothing um, new to add, but I just wanted to say that I agree with all the comments that were made and, and have problems as well with the application. Thank you. Um, okay, so it looks like we have uh, a number of issues with this application, uh, the sliding door being one, uh, the amount of signage and the amount of illumination, although we understand this illumination is uh, inside the, uh, the, the store and uh, 18 inches behind the, uh, the glass. 
it will certainly bleed um, into um, the uh, the exterior um, to some extent, and certainly at, at night time. Um, are there any other elements uh, that we want to note as, as being elements of concern? Are there any elements that we want to note as uh, being okay with which we don't have any issue? Okay, I see no raised hands and I will consider that uh, you're fine with what I have listed. Um, so I would like to make a motion to deny the application uh, for the reasons that I just stated and um, invite the applicant to uh, revise their, uh, their proposal if they uh, so choose. Um, I think that we, I would like to add language uh, as Karen stated that uh, when, when a, um, a large corporation chooses to uh, um, put their store in a uh, historic district, they should really defer to, uh, to the landmark and to the quality of the historic district. Um, and for that reason, we're making this, uh, this recommendation. Um, so this is, this is the motion, motion to deny. We have a, a, second. Second. a second. A second. Second. All right, so for the second vote of the evening, uh, Buzz. Yes. Renee Tafaro. Yes. Uh, James. James. I can't hear James, I'll come back to you, Sarah. Yes. Uh, Laura. Yes. John. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Suzanne. Suzanne. Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Yes. Mike. Yes. Renee Pinsella. Yes. Sam. Yes. Chuck. Yes. Uh, Janet. Yes. Uh, Karen. Yes. Tony. Yes. Uh, Leila, I'm a yes. And uh, James, is James still, still with us? Buzz is here, but I think he must have his volume down because um, he's not responding. Um, okay, all right. Uh, so the motion uh, passes and it's a unanimous vote. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are moving on to our uh, final application. And this is uh, 201 Park Avenue South. Um, this is the, uh, the W Hotel. And I think we have the applicants with us. Um, so applicants, if you want to load up your um, uh, your presentation and share your screen. We can uh, then get started. Thank you very much. Hi everyone. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Maxwell Powell. I'm a partner at Biomedical Architects, um, and uh, we're here in reference uh, to uh, proposed rooftop alterations to the W Hotel building on 17th and Park Avenue South. Um, the proposed alteration uh, that you'll see today is part of actually a planned broader interior uh, renovation of the hotel. It's first renovation since it opened back in uh, 2000, really. So it's sort of been over 20 years um, that uh, it's sort of, um, you know, uh, since its last renovation. Um, there are a number of infrastructure uh, upgrades that are necessary uh, as part of this renovation, which includes uh, mechanical and life safety changes as well as um, a programmatic change uh, to be able to occupy and use the roof, the rooftop of the building. Um, so this proposal seeks to accommodate both of those objectives, um, which is uh, in, in a rational and an appropriate manner um, while furthering sort of the relevance of this really iconic building. Um, I did want to note that um, this proposal does not seek any changes to any of the historic uh, facade elements of the building. It's, it's really restricted to everything that's on the roof itself. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll kind of run through our presentation here. Um, as you know, the, the building is on 17th and uh, Park Avenue South. It was designated an in individual landmark back in uh, 1988. Um, and as what we like to do when we start these projects is to sort of um, do a little bit of a research and see what we can dig up 
uh, to kind of uh, figure out what sort of the timeline was for the building in terms of the changes over time. Uh, and there's a couple of moments um, in sort of history of the building where there were a few changes to the roof, and I'll kind of go over uh, some of that with you. Um, so the building was built uh, in 1910, 1911, uh, designed by Dench and Yost. Um, you know, it was sort of a, a really sort of classic example of a tripartite uh, columnar uh, skyscraper design with a very distinctive rustic base and a shaft and capped with an amazing four-story mansard roof um, that you can see here under construction and, and as it was completed. Um, and contrasting that with a very sort of modern uh, sort of industrial signage piece that sort of ran, runs the entire length along 17th Street and at the time represented the name of the company that the building was built for, which was uh, Germania Light. Um, you know, the, the, the sign actually did change names back in 1918, and that was due largely to World War I and sort of the association uh, with the name. But I think uh, sort of these, this image here, you know, does represent, um, you know, uh, sort of a very functional use of the roof, even, you know, from the day that the building was built, uh, you know, with sort of flues and chimneys and bulkheads and, and so forth. Um, in 1940, um, you know, one of the sort of the most significant changes to the facade was that the balcony on the 16th floor actually got removed. And we couldn't figure out why or what the reasoning was, but that was sort of the, sort of the this one piece that um, uh, on the facade that actually changed. And so the rest of the building is largely kind of stayed intact in terms of uh, what it looks like from the time it was built. Um, uh, in the 1950s, uh, there was a storefront replacement program on the ground floor, uh, which leads us to sort of the, the first major uh, change on the roof, which occurred in 1960 when uh, there was sort of a renovation um, of the infrastructure uh, portion of the building where two cooling towers were installed on the roof sort of directly behind the Guardian Life sign. Uh, and this was sort of be um, consistent as, as we move forward um, in, in time. Uh, by 1988, uh, of course, the building was designated as an individual landmark in the city by the Landmarks Commission, which takes us to 1999-2000, which was, which was the conversion of this office building into the W Hotel that we know today, right? So that was a, a significant change at the time. Um, you know, obviously, the signage changed um, to W Union Square, but keeping in terms of the historical uh, signs, uh, uh, typography, um, there was a significant amount of rooftop changes uh, related to new equipment that had to go up on the roof. Um, there were storefront changes as well as a new uh, marquee um, at the entry. So that's sort of, um, you know, a pretty significant series of changes uh, when the building was last renovated you know, 20 years ago, which of course takes us to today um, and sort of these uh, these views back to the building from uh, Union Square looking across uh, towards the building or from the south or from the east looking back west to the western facade um, of the building. And you can kind of see that uh, today you know, there are some um, um, equipment uh, that, that, that are uh, quite visible up on the roof, right? So you've got um, if I zoom in here, a cooling tower located here, a large uh, RTU, as well as um, a, the generator uh, for the building. Um, so um, with that in mind, um, if we just sort of focus in on the rooftop itself, um, we're actually able to dig up the original drawing for the roof plan, which is kind of interesting. Um, this is sort of back in 1910, and you could see sort of the configuration of the roof included these nine um, skylights um, at the time, and this was what was actually built. So it's a little different, right? But that's not particularly unusual in buildings that were built in this time that, you know, changes were sort of made on the fly as the building was constructed, but you could see how the um, so the skylights were turned, there were more skylights, the bulkhead was a little bit bigger than, you know, sort of what was originally drawn. Um, just in terms of reference, uh, the Park Avenue South is on this frontage here, uh, and 17th Street is, is running up, up, down, up, up, up and down. Um, the middle image is uh, the condition of the roof in, in 1960, when the two cooling towers were installed right behind the sign, which is right here, so it's sort of almost touching uh, the armature for the sign uh, back there. Um, and 
in the image on the far right, that's sort of where it is today when it was renovated back in 1999. A significant amount of uh, mechanical equipment was put up there. The cooling tower was replaced with a large um, uh, HVAC unit, essentially with a lot of ductwork and fans. Um, and the generator, a generator was added um, on, along the Park Avenue South uh, frontage. Uh, so those sort of the big pieces, as well as some internal um, uh, equipment that was added within the existing bulkheads. Um, and then this is sort of a pictorial view of those three stages as well, um, you know, as it was built, um, as it uh, looked from the 1960s with the two cooling towers and where, uh, what it looks like largely today right, with, the, with the equipment up on the roof. So what it tells us is, um, you know, from this sort of brief history is that, you know, the roof has changed over time and it has changed because of the functions of the building, which, you know, doesn't really sort of surprise us, you know, given the sort of long legacy uh, and use of this, of this great building. Um, so uh, uh, with that, and, and as an aside, um, historically, the, the classic hotels that were built around the time that this building was built in the turn of the century in the 1910s, you know, actually did have, um, did utilize a lot of their rooftops. So whether it's the Astor Hotel, the Biltmore, or the Ritz-Carlton, um, they're really good examples of um, uh, usable rooftops, either in enclosed spaces or open spaces or partially enclosed spaces, um, which you know, really form part of the use and sort of the milieu of these buildings and these uses. So in a way, we also want to sort of replicate that in sort of today's um, uh, uh, language um, for this building and on this uh, very important location overlooking Union Square. Um, all right, so how do we do that, right? So our challenge, of course, is to turn this on the screen into something that's more usable uh, so that people can actually go up there. So this, these are photos of the existing roof. This is a little key plan on the side, but you can see the, uh, the generator that's sort of sitting up there facing Park Avenue South, um, the cooling tower, and then sort of this maze of uh, uh, ductwork and uh, this large uh, piece of uh, mechanical equipment sort of right behind the W Union Square uh, sign. So that sort of gives us a little bit of context of, of uh, where we are today. Uh, this is a diagram that shows that same context, sort of a little bit cleaned up to, to, to show what we're proposing to do here. Um, but the elements, if you can see in this sort of lightly dashed red outline, these are the elements that we're proposing to modify to, to be able to sort of uh, tackle the, the, uh, the, the two-pronged approach of trying to deal with the infrastructure upgrades that we need to do on the building and also to provide rooftop access for people and for the public. So um, one of the first um, uh, um, modifications that we wanted to make was to actually raise, um, well, first of all, was to sort of clear it as much as we could along the southwest corner of the roof. It has sort of the most visibility back to Union Square. It's also um, uh, to a certain degree, sort of the messiest part when you look up uh, at the building. Um, and, uh, and, and sort of the idea that this portion would be that occupiable zone, whether it's outdoors or indoor, indoor space. Um, in order to do that, we wanted to raise the walking surface of this portion of the roof by about 30 inches. And the reason for that is the parapet is quite high. It's about seven feet, almost seven feet above the existing roof. So by raising the walking surface about 30 inches, we're able to sort of uh, have a relationship with the parapet that's more at a guard uh, rail height uh, where people can actually oversee and, and look, over, um, look over the existing parapet. Um, when we did that, of course, the, the stair bulkhead needs to also rise up as well because we need to be able to get people out onto the roof. Um, and we also wanted to provide and need to provide um, elevator access for ADA access up to the roof, uh, which of course for the 110 years of this history of the building that does not currently exist. Um, in order to do that, there are a couple of big moves infrastructurally that we need to do. One is we need to figure out what to do with this large piece of um, uh, mechanical equipment. And we figured a, sort of a smart way to split that up and relocate that to the Eastern side um, of the roof. And the other piece was to rethink what we did with the generator. Um, so in order for us to meet today's codes and today's uh, life safety loads for the generator, um, if we were to leave the generator in place, it would have had to have grown in height considerably. 
as well as an additional room would have been needed to have all the switch gear um, functions that go along with the generator, meaning that this generator would have had to shift towards the street uh, as well as rise up by about six additional feet. Um, so luckily, uh, we went back in and took a look at all of the um, equipment that was, uh, how, was housed in the existing bulkhead, and we found that there was a good portion with it, within the northeast corner of this bulkhead that was actually not utilized. So our strategy was to actually take um, an, an outdoor exposed uh, generator and move it indoors. Uh, and the way to do that is we had to, all, to expand the existing bulkhead, both in height by, uh, by about 30 inches, as well as grow the length of the bulkhead. And we thought that was a good trade-off because we were able to take something that's outdoors and just exposed and making noise whenever they run the system and put it indoors and hide it behind, um, you know, sort of enlarged a bulkhead that already exists in place. And I'll show you what, uh, how that um, comes into play. Um, so from an infrastructural point of view, this is what results from what I sort of uh, uh, described, right? So the, uh, the raised walking surface over here, the, um, the, the taller stair bulkhead, the, the new elevator bulkhead for access for ADA and the slightly expanded uh, new generator um, uh, enclosure uh, where the former um, uh, bulkhead sort of uh, landed right in this zone here. Um, so adding to that then, we, are, we wanted to also look at how we would create an enclosable space, uh, a functional space up on the roof so that it could be used uh, year round. Um, guests and the public could come up to the roof and really sort of be able to enjoy the vantage point um, that we have here um, overlooking Union Square, as well as, you know, to a certain degree also enjoy to this very iconic sign, um, you know, that's been essentially closed to the public. Um, the design of the, in, the structure itself was really carefully chosen and, and have some uh, slides of what the system is, but it's essentially sort of an L-shaped lean to uh, series of panels that are uh, leaning up against the, um, the bulkhead itself. Um, and they're about six to seven feet wide and they actually can open up. And the strategy with this, with sort of this idea of this lean to structure is that we could keep the eave line as low as possible to minimize the sight line effect uh, when viewing it from the street. Um, and the second piece of it was we intentionally chamfered uh, this corner, the southwest corner, again, with an eye to uh, this idea of sort of minimizing the, the, the sight line from the street. Obviously, if we took this out to the corner, we'd not only sort of um, have a, 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 a more visible sight line from the street, but we're also sort of be encroaching uh, upon sort of the, the W portion of the terrace. Uh, so this is what we are proposing in terms of, of this um, this glass structure. The other uh, element is, um, you know, it's, it's our strong belief as well that, you know, any sort of new addition that we place uh, on, on a historic building ought to be of today's time. It, it should be contemporary. It should be distinctly different than um, the, the style of the historic portion of the building. And, and we believe that uh, sort of a glass and metal enclosure like this could, could certainly accomplish that and, and be sleek and as well as be minimally visible. Um, so, and, I, and, and it's one of the wonderful things about the system is that it could open up, which allows, um, you know, the W Hotel to actually use this in different ways, uh, in ways that we may not even know how we're going to use it today, given uh, sort of the situation we are in uh, in our country. But this allows us to have the outdoor space and indoor space and be able to uh, use it in a, in a very, very flexible manner. Um, all right, so the, the next series of slides are just a series of before and afters of, of sort of technical drawings, plans, and elevations. Uh, so this is just the existing plan of the roof, uh, diagramming the generator. Park Avenue is on the left, 17th Street is, uh, is, is running along the bottom of the page. Uh, and again, so the idea of relocating the generator into this bulkhead here, taking this unit, splitting them up, cooling tower stays, it's going to be replaced in kind, but it'll, it'll stay because there's really no other place to put it, unfortunately. Um, and then the, uh, the, 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 the glass structure located on the corner. Just jump to that. So this is the, um, the proposed plan. So you'll see how we've, you know, intentionally taken the proposed structure and sort of tied it back to the bulkhead and sort of, you know, 
leaned up against it, uh, creating a setback along its full perimeter, which currently doesn't exist as well. Again, providing a little bit more relief uh, from the sign and also the ability for people to be able to actually go up the edge of the building. Um, there's a little sort of uh, funky little platform idea here that uh, we have here, which is uh, basically sort of a series of steps uh, that would have a glass guardrail, of course, we don't want any um, dangerous situations there, but sort of this idea of being able to have people, you know, actually uh, be a little bit closer to the sign itself and also be able to have a slightly different vantage point looking back down uh, to Union Square. Um, so as we take a look at the comparison and elevation, uh, this is the existing elevation along 17th Street. So it's the south elevation of the building. Uh, again, you'll see the W sign, the cooling tower, the big uh, mechanical unit that currently exists, um, and the proposed uh, glass structure that is sort of right behind the sign there, set back um, in replace of that uh, piece of equipment, um, as well as um, the expanded bulkhead that you can see sort of further beyond on the north uh, east corner of the building. Um, on the uh, Park Avenue side, uh, you can see sort of the same comparison uh, from what it is today, the generator, the bulkhead, the piece of equipment, which you can actually see in this comparison is uh, shows how close it is to the sign um, versus what we are proposing here. Again, a very sort of simple uh, formal structure uh, up on the roof here that kind of just cleans up the roof line uh, that uh, may be visible, uh, minimally visible from the street. And then the third facade is the east, uh, the east facing facade, or the, I guess the west facade uh, facing, um, facing the east, which uh, shows the uh, enlarged bulkhead where the generator would be housed. And there's a couple of points here that I just, I just wanted to call out. One is the, the increase in height will match the existing um, uh, party wall, the existing parapet wall that exists on the north uh, side of the building. So we're not going any higher than that. We're able to get the generator to get squeezed down uh, to fit within that height. And that the materiality and the, um, the cladding on the new uh, bulkhead portion will match in both the materiality and sort of the finish that's there today, which is essentially a copper standing seam uh, wall panel that uh, just given over the years is a pre sort of a pre patinaed copper. So it's sort of this grayish bluish uh, color. So we will replace that in kind. It'll, it'll essentially look the same. Um, the plane of this wall is the same plane as the wall that's there today as well. So we're not pulling it out any further uh, towards the east. Um, so uh, these are just uh, some images of uh, this, uh, this same system on some other projects. And uh, what's really sort of interesting and sort of modern about it is they come in single pieces that are basically this L shape and they're each of them are about six or seven feet wide and they have the ability to telescope and, and open, but it's just a very simple glass and metal frame system. Uh, that's very, very transparent, uh, uh, both indoors and outdoors. Um, in terms of the materiality, the roofing portion of it will be a translucent polycarbonate uh, panel. Uh, the wall portion, the vertical portion would just be a, a one inch glass IGU. Um, and then any metal framing portions will be a powder coated uh, aluminum um, uh, uh, frame uh, that we are calling out for a sort of a medium bronze color to match and go with the, the rest of the look of, of, the, of the building and, and the roof. Uh, so lastly, we've got some sightline studies. Uh, so uh, last week we were able to actually get the mock-up put in place. I'm not sure um, how many of you were able to uh, take a look, um, but uh, the diagram on the bottom left is uh, basically what was installed in on, on site given all the equipment that's there. But if you sort of play connect the dots, you can kind of get a sense of um, how this is all being connected. Uh, so this portion here would be the glass enclosed structure. This uh, portion here is the, um, the stair bulkhead and a portion of the elevator bulkhead and the portion back in the northeast corner is the expanded bulkhead housing the generator. So what we've done on these views is to sort of put them all side by side. So the left uh, most image is going to be the existing condition, the, just a plain photo of where the, the shot is taken from. The proposed is in the middle, so that might show a removal of equipment or uh, the structure, we can see it. And then the image on the right is the uh, 
pretty close uh, approximation of where we took the first photos a, a few months ago, um, but with the mock-up. So if you see any orange netting, you'll see that those are the pieces uh, that are, are, are visible. So from this vantage point, which is basically from the farmer's market, middle of the square, roughly 16th Street, looking back at the building, there's actually really no difference between existing proposed or, or the mock-up. You don't really see any, any difference there. Um, if we sort of slide ourselves down um, Park Avenue South towards 15th Street and look back towards the building, um, you do see a few changes. So I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see it here. Um, so this is the existing condition. You can see obviously the, the cooling tower and the, uh, the large mechanical equipment in the proposed uh, scenario. You, sorry. Our alarm here. Um, uh, you don't see the uh, the, the mechanical because obviously that's been removed. Um, and in this view, you don't actually see the the um, the glass enclosure. Um, and in, that's proven out by the the mock up here, which does not show any orange netting as well. So we'll just kind of quickly go through this. Um, if you can always still hear me. Um, a third view is uh, a view that's actually further south. So we went past 14th Street. We're actually mid-block between 14th and 13th on Broadway, looking back at the building, right? So this is sort of um, one viewpoint where you see the most of the roof. And again, as we zoom in, uh, you can see in the existing condition, the RTU, the cooling tower. And this piece right in here is actually the existing bulkhead that's about 20 feet back. Right, so you're actually seeing the bulkhead that's back there, um, sort of that greenish color over there. Um, in the proposed condition with the RTU removed, uh, you do see uh, um, a portion of the glass enclosure, but that's all falling in sort of in front of the uh, existing bulkhead, which you can actually see that's sort of back in here, right? So again, I think part of the strategy for us was to streamline what you see on the corner, the most important corner of the building essentially, and sort of clean it up a little bit. And I think that's what we've achieved here. Um, the, uh, if we look at the mock-up, uh, that orange netting here is actually basically this panel right here. So that sort of proves out that that's what we're gonna likely see in reality as well. Uh, the fourth view is the, uh, the view on 17th Street, looking west back at the, uh, the enlarged uh, bulkhead. So similarly, again, we would do this uh, in our proposal, match the, um, the texture and the finish of this bulkhead. It's going to rise up to the height of the existing wall. Uh, and it will expand towards the south for us to be able to house uh, the generator and the mock-up shows the, you know, sort of the equivalent size um, that's shown there. Uh, view five is um, a view from across the park on 15th uh, Street and uh, Union Square West, looking back at the building. Um, and here, uh, likewise, you can see actually from this vantage point, uh, the generator, the RTU and the cooling tower. And as proposed, obviously there's no generator, there's no RTU, but you can sort of minimally see sort of the top of the glass enclosure poking up above the parapet. And again, that's uh, proven out by the, um, the little bit of the orange netting that's showing up in, in the box up over here. Um, and then I think the last uh, handful of slides, um, uh, there's actually no difference between the before, after, and, uh, uh, or mock-up, just simply because um, of the viewpoints and what we wanted to go around all sides of the building to sort of be able to show you uh, what you'd be able to see. So this is on 17th Street looking east. There's really no change uh, in any of that, in any of these images. Um, Park Avenue South looking south from 18th Street. Similarly, you don't see anything different here. Uh, and then sort of the straight up views uh, looking up uh, back at the building. Uh, there's there's also uh, no difference. So, um, you know, with that, I, I think that sort of concludes our our my our presentation. Um, you know, I think you know for us it was sort of um, uh, it was important for us to sort of address both issues of infrastructure and being able to occupy the building. I think as architects and urbanists, um, we're always looking for ways to occupy the fifth facade, which is the roof. And we think that's really important. Um, just urbanistically, but even more so important um, in sort of in today's um, today's context as well. So I appreciate your time and, and and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Do you have to exit your building and uh, take notice of this uh, <laughs> alarm, no, or I, you're you're fine? You're safe. You can stay with us a little longer. 
Yeah, I, I can say, I think it's just a normal testing, but, but I will mute myself. <laughs> Thank you. We don't want any unnecessary risk being taken for, for these hearings. Uh, thank you so much for a very thorough presentation. Uh, members of the committee, do we have questions? And I see that Suzanne has her hand up. Suzanne, go ahead. Um, so um, regarding all of the uh, view that you've provided, which is very helpful to see the fifth facade, um, and this is exciting for this hotel. So who doesn't love a rooftop? Um, but I'm just curious what this looks like at night. What are their exit signs? How is this illuminated? I've only seen what this looks like during the day at every angle, but I would think that this would be illuminated. Can you speak to that? Yes, sure, of course. You know, I, I think they would obviously wouldn't want to use, be able to use the space day, day and night. I think the, the nice thing about uh, the system that we've chosen is that the roof itself is a translucent roof, right? So it's not uh, just emanating light coming out if it, if it was a clear roof. So I think that will filter some of the light. But I think um, as you can see from the view, the view uh, studies, what you can actually see of the uh, the rooftop, the, the glass enclosure is very, very minimal. So I don't think we're going to be you know, lighting up Union Square in, in, in any way. Um, I think it will be a nice glow uh, up on the roof and uh, it'll be it'll be sort of in context with um, sort of the, the top of the building. Thank you. Um, Suzanne, do you have a follow up question? Um, Oh, you're, you're muted. Suzanne, you're muted. Um, am I, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, I guess I just, uh, just a little pushback. Isn't contextually the fact that the sign, you can see W Union Square so well, or just the, the sign, I just was curious how that background light would impact just contextually um, sort of sign and how it sort of stands on its own without any backlighting. Just contextually. Yeah, no. It's, it's a very good question. The sign is much taller than the, uh, the, the glass structure. Uh, I'm sorry. The, the sign is much taller. The sign is also, if, if you, I'm sure you know, it's, it's red, but it's got a, a solid back uh, backing to it, right? So the, um, I can point to this, the, the actual lighting uh, cube is in the front of the W. So it, it does have a background to it. So we don't think it will affect the of uh, the visibility of the sign in any way. I mean, that's that's certainly not something that the hotel would want us to do either, to sort of interfere with the visibility of the sign. Uh, but I do believe that the fact that the, the structure is so minimally visible, um, the lighting of the structure itself, I, I really don't believe it will um, cause an impact in terms of its relationship to the sign. Okay, thank you. Um, I see that Richard has a question. Richard, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Maxwell. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, I, I found that the mock-up's very helpful, but I think it was the next to last one of them that you showed, I thought you rushed through, and you didn't get to the third piece, which was the mock-up. Uh, I don't know if it was 35, 36. Uh, no, the one before that, so I guess it's 35. Could you step us through that again, including showing the uh, the mock-up? Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, so uh, in, the in the proposal, uh, in the proposed view, you can see a little bit of the the eave line of the uh, glass structure, uh, sort of broken up from this vantage point. And in the mock-up, you can see that as well. There's a little bit of orange netting here, and it, it sort of continues on and sort of tapers away. Um, so, so that's what you would see from this particular vantage point. And, you know, I suspect uh, as well, um, you know, I'm taking it from this view. Um, if we're further back, you'll see a tiny little bit more of it. Right. But could you, that's for the uh, west, west facade. Can you do the same showing for, for the south facade? Uh, yes, I think I have. It's the same page. The, 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 that same page. Oh, yeah, is, yeah. Yeah, I'm that's sorry. what I'm saying. So, yeah, that's the piece yeah. I, that I really missed. Yeah, so the self facade, you don't actually see the, um, the enclosure because uh, we, you know, the, the enclosure is set back from the sign. So there's a little bit more distance back there. So you don't see it. Uh, and that's why in the mock up, you don't see any orange knitting up here. 
what, what I'm seeing, I'm, what I think I'm seeing in the mock-up looks somehow bigger, uh, you know, more robust than what I'm seeing in the middle one. Yeah, and, and the reason for that is, um, are, are you referring to this element? Yeah, I guess it's that piece. Yeah. Yes. So that's the that's the existing condition with the the mock-up. So that's the art, the uh, equipment, the mechanical equipment that's there that will be removed in this proposal. So that's why in the proposal you don't see it. It's okay, gone. and but in in the, in the mocked up you do see it. Well, the, the mocked, mocked up is, was the mocked up of the uh, of the proposed. No, the mockup is a physical mockup on the roof that exists right. today, right? So we have to, you know. Oh, I see. There's no red there. It just exists currently. Yeah. I see. So the, j just so that everybody is clear, I know it's a little confusing. The mockup photographs are actual photographs. Right. They're not rendering. Right. They're not altered images. They're actually real photographs of the existing condition of the building with the orange netting and the orange netting is meant to represent the addition. So what right. you see is actually elements that will disappear because they are being relocated at other areas of the roof then that become uh, non-visible from uh, thoroughfares. Uh, thanks to both of you, that, that clarified it, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Karen has a question. Karen, yes, go ahead. Yes, if you can go to the slide that has the highest element of the uh, proposed mock-up, it's about the elevator bulkhead. And if you could just talk about the top of the, the sorry, what is the elevation of the highest proposed new addition? And I think it's at the top of the elevator bulkhead. And does that exceed any element that's currently the highest? Because I think you had a datum line that showed everything was below it. And I just, uh, that's my question. Can you confirm if the elevator bulkhead um, is visible or higher than any other existing element? Well, let me just get to that page. And, um... I, th I think the page that you had was, was the correct page. Right, so, so this is the elevator bulkhead. 18.7 is measured to existing roof elevation. Um, and uh, so, so no, nothing is higher than uh, the tallest existing element, which happens to be the northern wall of the building, which is this piece here. Mm. It's at 23 feet. And I'm just not quite understanding. Can you point to the top of the elevator bulkhead again? Because if the elevator is landing on the roof, unless it's a unique uh, type of elevator, typically one story above that landing is, you know, the elevator machine room and the mechanics. Yeah, so it's, it'll be a um, hydraulic elevator. Uh, to minimize the overrun. So it'll be a, a side piston holeless uh, um, uh, hydraulic elevator. So the overrun here is roughly the last floor plus the overrun. I can do my math on the fly. It's about 16 feet, which is, which is just adequate to get an elevator in there, a two-stop elevator that serves from this floor up to the roof. I see. So 16 feet above the top of the roof or 16 feet above the proposed feet, new penthouse addition. 60 feet above the new raised terrace level. So the finished floor of the roof, essentially. The finished Just floor of question. the roof. Thank you. Just a follow up question on that. Um, what about the, uh, the generator enclosure? Yeah. That is taller, correct? Yes, that is taller. Um, here it is, right? So the generator roof is 23 feet, two inches from the existing roof, which is what we're calling the stadium over here. Um, and again, that matches the height of the Northern existing wall. And we tried to you know, make sure that we're not any taller than that. You kind of use that as your datum to hold, not to breach and work down and have yeah. equipment to you know, stay contained under that datum, I yeah. see. It's still a struggle to get it all in there, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm it, sure it, it, it you did a good job. You did a great job. I'm sorry, J just to continue on, on that line of questioning, it looks like there is a faint line um, that looks like a, I don't know, a, a, some shape of uh, some element that is above the, um, yes, this element above the uh, 
uh, enclosed generator. Uh, can you speak to that? Yes, absolutely. So that is a, um, it's some sort of a venting unit. So uh, in order for us to keep the enclosure as low as possible, there's a piece of the unit uh, that we had to locate onto the roof. Um, otherwise we would have to increase the height and put louvers up above and, and all of that stuff. So but I'll show you what that looks like in Axon. It's actually a little bit clearer to see. Um, hold on one second. So it's this. So it's a um, it's a radiator for the generator. It's how they expel the the hot um, air, I guess, coming out of the generator when they fire it. But we strategically located that, obviously, as interior as possible. So you it doesn't show up in any of the views because it's so far from any of the building edges, um, as well as it's partially blocked by you know this bulkhead itself. So it's this it's this piece of equipment that's sitting on this roof. Okay. All right, got it. Thank, thank you so much. Thank well, you. it's the tallest. It's not visible in the mock-ups. That's correct. That's correct. And then you know, okay. I yeah. didn't mention this here. There's there's a there's a pressurization fan for life safety that we we need to add to the building as well. Also not visible because it's pushed so far back. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Does that address your your questions? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions on uh, this application from members of the committee? Um, Suzanne, I see you have your hand up. We're still in questions. Uh, yes, yeah, so quickly, um, and maybe it's here and I'm just not seeing it um, because I can't read it. Um, there's a stairway up, stairwell up to the roof as well, accessed by L um, stair other than elevator. Yeah, so there are actually two stairs. Um, there are two stairs that come up to the roof. This is one of them. This is the new elevator that's coming up. And there's another stair that's just in this in this volume that we're not touching. It, it'll, okay. it'll serve the two means out. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other uh, questions from members of the committee? Any more questions? Okay, seeing none, I will open up the floor to members of the public. Do we have uh, any members of the public who wish to speak to this matter, uh, ask questions uh, to the applicant? Um, you can use the raise hand uh, function or press, what is it again, Luke? Star, star nine. nine? Star nine, okay. Star nine for the call-in users or raise hand uh, function for uh, those who are uh, online with us. I see none. And let's move to a business session. Members of the committee, uh, what are your comments to this application? Any comments? Okay, then I will call upon uh, some, oh, okay, Laura. Laura, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, um, Leila. Uh, the proposed changes I um, looks very neat and uh, clean and um, safe, as opposed to the clutter that and uh, that we see uh, in the existing condition and uh, clutter and busy looking, if I might add, an environment. And um, by relocating the generator and relocating the bulky corridor and the mechanical equipment, it actually looks organized and leaves the space for the um, roofing axis and walking area, um, which brought, um, which um, made the, um, um, the rooftop, um, you know, really neat. And uh, the seasonal structure looks um, cool to me. So I'm, I'm, I'm um, I agree with the proposal or I approve of the proposal. Okay, th thank you, Laura. Other uh, comments from uh, members of the committee? We need comments. This is the last application. Come on guys, don't be shy. Uh, I see a hand up. Um, yeah, Suzanne. You're muted, Suzanne. Yep, got it. I got it. It's on. 
Um, I, I agree with Laura. I mean, I think that um, uh, this is a well-organized, um, resourceful um, way to activate a space that will hopefully be helpful to um, maintain this beautiful building. And um, I hope the lighting isn't obnoxious, mm -hmm. but that, um, that it is done in a tasteful way and that will activate again this business and um, have people enjoy it. And I'll go, I'll go and have a cocktail up the on the roof. <laughs> I, I, Thank I, you. I wish them well, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mike, key back. Yeah. Um, so I'm going along with the majority. I certainly uh, approve of how they made uh, effort to make all the new structures hidden from view as best as possible, and only a tiny little peek through. I, I vote that uh, this, we accept this application. Thank you. Um, James. Uh, I too am supportive as well. I think they did a very good job of the presentation and they've been good stewards of this building. So I think uh, it's, it's worthy of approval. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Buzz? Buzz, you're, you're muted. muted. Uh, I too approve, but I can't resist saying uh, as a member of the uh, PSQL, uh, when this comes to PSQL for liquor license, it will receive a somewhat different re uh, reception. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, so certainly, um, our, our board is uh, gravely concerned about uh, rooftop activity and uh, we want to regulate it so as not to create any uh, negative impact to our uh, yeah, Yes, yes, yes. Uh, on a purely landmark standpoint. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, very, it's very well. <laughs> Let, let's hope that they will manage the liquor license the, uh, the, the same way in a uh, harmonious and uh, tasteful fashion. Um, other comments? Uh, Richard, go ahead. Uh, as someone who's been ensconced for three and a half months now in Oakland, California, desperately missing New York City, I can't wait <laughs> to come back. I'm never going to cook another meal myself ever again. And I can't wait to come and really have a vibrant New York. So I'm very excited about this. Thank you, Karen. Yes, I echo what everybody said on the committee and want to compliment BBB on a really clever, incredible architectural feat of doing something fabulous and concealing it, unfortunately, but well done. Yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly concur. Really, very, very tasteful. I agree that you know that the structure is not meant in any way to be uh, you know a pastiche of the building, but it works. It's it's an elegant uh, way of uh, you know addressing this need. Um, I think that in, in time of COVID, we need as much outdoor space uh, as we can. Um, this will uh, be, you know, flexible and uh, it's, it's intelligent, it's, it's elegant and, uh, and it's entirely concealed from any thoroughfares, especially from, you know, the, the main facades. You know, we do acknowledge that on the, uh, you know, a northeast facade, there's a little bit of visibility from uh, this uh, generator enclosure. Um, I don't think that it's detracting in any way from the, uh, the historic fabric uh, or from the context of the neighborhood, although it's an individual landmark. But um, I think it's very clever um, and it looks like we have a motion to approve. And we need a second. Second. All right. Second. <laughs> Final vote of uh, the evening, uh, Buzz. Yes. Uh, Renee Cafaro. Yes. Uh, James. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Laura. Yes. Uh, John. Yes. 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 Richard. Yes. Mike. Yes. Renee Kinsella. I will come back to Renee. Sam? Yes. Um, uh, Chuck left. Uh, Janet? Yes. Karen? Yes. Um, I am a yes, and I'm coming back to Renee Kinsella. Is Renee still with us? 
Um, yeah, on the Lene call, is still with us, but... but she is uh, muted. Um, and okay, Tony. I... Oh, and Tony, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're uh, forgetting me. Yes. I changed sheets and I forgot you already. I am so bad. My apologies. No uh, and Tony is a yes. Um, Renee yes. Quintella, um, do you want to uh, record your vote? I don't think she can hear us. Um, okay, so nonetheless, uh, motion passes unanimous vote. Um, thank you very much to uh, all of you for uh, your time and patience. And uh, on that note, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Good night.